Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and welcome to NJ Spotlight News. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. Russian forces have invaded Ukraine on what is being called the darkest day in Europe since World War II. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordering a large-scale military attack across the country. The first unprovoked full-scale act of war on a sovereign European nation in more than 80 years. Dozens of Ukrainian troops and several civilians reported dead in the first hours of the conflict. Ukrainians are fleeing the capital of Kyiv and other cities as President Zelensky vows to defend the country, calling on citizens to take up arms against Russian forces. Putin saying any country that interferes would be met with consequences you have never seen in history. President Biden said today that U.S. forces will not engage in conflict in Ukraine, but issue new sanctions. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe costs on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. We have purposefully designed these sanctions to maximize the long-term impact on Russia and to minimize the impact on the United States and our allies. As the invasion continues, Ukrainians are now seeking safety and shelter. A curfew has been put in place in Kyiv. Subway stations are being used as bomb shelters, with neighboring countries expected to see at least one million refugees. 20-hour waits are being seen along the border with Poland as Ukrainians try to escape the violence. In response to Putin's attack, protests have erupted around the world, including in Russian cities, where thousands have taken to the streets. And a unanimous condemnation of President Putin has been issued by all our European allies. New Jersey's congressional delegation is also condemning the invasion. Congressman Frank Pallone today. I think the answer is very severe sanctions. You know, uh, the president says that these, these sanctions are going to hurt Russia, hurt their leaders, hurt their economy. And that's already happening. There, there were reports this morning that the, that the Russian stock market was near collapse. And I'm going to be uh, very supportive of, of uh, the most severe sanctions as possible because I do believe um, that, um, that ultimately, um, you know, this is going to be, uh, this is going to, this is going to really be punishing uh, to Russia. Joining me now to explain the situation and the impact here in New Jersey is former Time Magazine senior reporter and professor emeritus of political science at St. Peter's University, Alan Sanders. Alan, Ukraine may be a half a world away, but could we be impacted by this war here in Jersey? Is it just a rise in gas prices, or will we see other impacts to the economy or military? Well, certainly uh, oil and gas prices will be seriously affected, and uh, uh, that's a great worry for uh, consumers and, of course, for the president here in the United States. But remember, any war situation creates disruption, commercial and economic disruption. So this has the implication uh, of affecting other uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, one in particular is wheat. Uh, Ukraine is a great producer of wheat, and uh, that will uh, mean that uh, wheat prices and food prices that are related to wheat uh, could also rise. Uh, and then, of course, course, there is the danger of cyber attacks, and those could disrupt uh, economic and financial uh, markets as well. So uh, any war situation, aside from the immediate obvious things like oil and gas and perhaps wheat, uh, uh, creates great uncertainty. And that's why you're seeing the stock market uh, do a uh, rather dramatic drop today, uh, because economic factors uh, will be impacted. All kinds of economic factors will be impacted by uh, the war situation in Europe. And any other, you know, impacts that he, people here in Jersey should be worried about or that we could see in the coming weeks? 
Well, I think uh, one of the things that uh, will be occurring is it will impact the political environment here. Uh, if we go back to a Cold War kind of situation in which the West is united against uh, uh, Russian aggression and uh, uh, Russia and its allies, and that means also China, uh, that will mean that uh, there will be a Cold War political mentality. Uh, that could lead to increased uh, defense spending, uh, and that will have an impact, of course, on the spending that is available for social programs. The U.S. has been warning of this invasion for weeks, and the U.S. and its European allies have tried to prevent this through war, diplomatic talks, and now increased sanctions. Why did those efforts fail, or was this invasion inevitable? Well, I think the invasion was inevitable. Uh, Mr. Putin has been uh, pursuing a foreign policy of grievances, and this is the latest, uh, most uh, dramatic uh, example of that. Uh, the only way really to stop Putin's uh, politics of grievances would have been for a direct military intervention by the United States and NATO. Now, that obviously would be a nightmare scenario. So what the United States and its allies have decided is to uh, impose heavy costs on Russia. Now, this is something that will take time. Uh, it will take patience. Uh, but there's no, um, there was really no, no real possibility of military conflict because, uh, first of all, the United States is unprepared for that at the moment. Uh, the political points of view here in the United States do not uh, permit uh, the United States to engage in a major military war. But beyond that, uh, the, the casualties, the losses, the possibility of nuclear uh, escalation uh, it's so nightmarish that, that there was no real possibility. So the best the West could do was to threaten severe economic sanctions, and uh, quite uh, so. We've already heard reports of dozens of Ukrainian casualties. What could this human toll be? Well, uh, again, it depends on uh, where the Russian military goes and, and how deep it goes into Ukraine. But certainly there will be civilian casualties. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Putin will have blood on his hands and will have to answer um, uh, to the moral and ethical considerations that all of this will present. Uh, but also another impact that will uh, undoubtedly occur is there will be refugees. Many Ukrainians will try to flee the war zone uh, and their immediate uh, source of uh, um, escape is the uh, bordering states uh, many of which uh, uh, are um, NATO allies. So one of the functions of the American military that's been sent to uh, our NATO allies is to help uh, with the immigration, uh, I should say not the immigration, but with the refugee uh, situation. Um, now, they're supposed to help only when refugees cross the border. Uh, we'll have to see how that how that plays out. But certainly there will be major refugee implications and that will mean resettlement, that will mean money will have to be spent to take care of the refugees. Uh, and uh, then of course there will be all the horribleness of uh, the blood that will be shed in Ukraine and that will impact not just uh, uh, armed forces, but unfortunately innocent civilians. A lot of unknowns as this war begins. And of course my heart goes out to all the people in Ukraine. Alan Sanders, thank you and I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Take care. In an effort to slow down the spread of COVID-19 in schools, the New Jersey Department of Health updated its recommendations for mask wearing and quarantining in grades K through 12. The new guidance comes ahead of March 7th when Jersey lifts its statewide mask mandate and leaves it up to schools and child care centers to decide whether to keep or lose the masks. So what are these new guidelines and what do parents and staff think of them? Joanna Gagas reports. There is no guarantee that it will not cause another outbreak. However, you will never know unless you try. I honestly think it's a preference. So for those who might be a little leery, just, you know, have their kids wear masks. But me personally, I think it's great. As March 7th approaches, parents around the state are getting used to the idea of masks coming off of kids in schools and childcare centers, even if some are still a bit apprehensive about it. This is something that needs to be experimented with on a short term basis to see if, you know, we really are at this endemic. But here at Ellie's Academy in Somerville, the masks won't come off right away. We're still going to move forward with keeping our masks in place for the children and the staff, just because we also don't want to be in a position where, God forbid, the numbers were to spike a lot. I think it's great that we're heading into a direction where, you know, we can not have masks, but, you know, we're still a little hesitant on just throwing them up in the air and getting rid of them as of March 7th. But Chatham Superintendent Mike LaSusa has a different approach. Our plan is to be mask optional, uh, plain and simple. 
But it's not that simple because the guidance offers many scenarios for when masks should go back on, like when community spread in the region hits orange or red during an active outbreak or when a student has been exposed and is in school through the test to stay program. And it recommends that students be spaced three feet apart wherever possible, all of the new guidelines still creating some confusion for districts around quarantining once the masks come off. Dr. Meg Fisher explains the intent. So if the children are still seated apart, as we hope that they will continue to do, then there would not be a close contact. It would only be people within three feet of the child, which really shouldn't be anyone. But that's not taking into consideration kids lined up in hallways where there is no possibility of distancing or kids having lunch where best intention is to keep kids separated, but they certainly do congregate. You know, Best intentions are what we have to do. So we want the children separated as much as they can be. And where there are situations that there's high transmission rates, as outlined in the guidance, there are times when schools really should consider going to the masking again. We have not been able to socially distance our students, especially at the middle school and high school levels since the beginning of the year. The students are eating together unmasked every day. So La Sousa is not going to quarantine according to the state guidance. We made the decision to move towards the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia recommendations for schools that students should not be quarantined due to exposure at school unless they become symptomatic. The state's isolation guidance for those infected with COVID remains five days at home, five additional days fully masked at school if symptoms have improved. But La Sousa takes issue with who would have to be quarantined, especially given the extremely high rates of student vaccinations in his district. One of the surprises in the DOH guidance over the past month has been their insistence that we quarantine students who are fully vaccinated but not yet boosted. We just felt as a school district that trying to broaden the quarantine parameters like that and leading to more students staying home when they don't need to stay home because they're asymptomatic uh, just wasn't in the best interest of students and their mental and uh, emotional well-being. La Sousa believes many more districts will follow the guidance from CHOP and do away with masks and quarantining altogether. But some health experts are concerned that as schools and the public shift away from mitigation strategies, they'll be hard to get back when needed. I am concerned about whether people will quickly pivot back to the prevention measures that we know work so well. I think some people will, but I remain very, very concerned about how politicized some of our key tools have become. Only time will tell. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Today, the state saw more than 1,400 new cases and 35 new deaths. This comes as the state has eased pandemic protocols. And on Wednesday, Governor Murphy saying the state will be ready if any other variants do suddenly surge while keeping a watchful eye on a newer subvariant, BA2, also known as the stealth variant, infecting a few foreign countries and states like New York, California, Texas, and now detected here in Jersey. But could it spread faster than the Omicron strain that swept across the state and in December? And how dangerous is this new variant, and should it be a cause for concern? Our health care writer, Lilo Staten, joins me to discuss it all. Lilo, now that the Omicron subvariant BA2 has been identified here in Jersey, should we be concerned? Such a great question, Raven, right? Everybody wants to know. The short answer is not yet. Um, we don't know enough, really. Um, there is some, as Dr. Lachitz from the state's communicable disease service told us yesterday, there is some evidence that it can spread more rapidly, um, as much as I've seen 30% more rapidly than Omicron and remember what, how quickly that ramped up. Um, but little else is known about it, right? It is, um, now the dominant, uh, strain in several countries, uh, Denmark for one, I believe India as well. Um, and they have seen an uptick in, in hospitalizations and even deaths as a result. Now, part of that, of course, is because people are starting to, um, to end mask mandates and, and other requirements. So it's more easy to spread now. So it's a little hard to, to compare them. But um, it's really too soon to know what this will mean here. But as Dr. Lipschitz said, we're not seeing huge numbers of cases here yet. It is here, but not in a big way. Well, you know, as the state is steadily winding down pandemic responses, as COVID cases and hospitalizations continue to decline, could the discovery of this subvariant set us back? 
Well, so I think that really it could. I think the question is how quickly are we willing to respond, right? Everybody feels like they're done with this pandemic. And for some people, like for, for us that are lucky to be healthy and young enough, um, you know, that's okay. Um, we can feel okay about that. But there are so many other people who are not able to get vaccinated, for example, infants um, or young children, or people who are not getting vaccinated by choice. And they are still at risk, right? And if a new variant right. um, introduced is introduced and starts to spread quickly, it doesn't, as we know from Omicron, it doesn't take long to get back into that surge situation where your healthcare is challenged. Remember New Year's, um, Christmas, nobody could find tests? Like that could potentially happen again if we aren't prepared. And I should say, Governor Murphy says, we have the resources, we will have the resources available should that happen, but nobody's seen signs of that yet. But will the current vaccines and boosters protect against this new subvariant? I think a lot of people also want to know that. Yeah, that's another really great question, and it's one we definitely don't have enough data for. What we saw with Omicron was boosters were critical. Um, it can still spread. Yes, the naysayers say boosters and shots don't work. No, that just means it, it spreads, but it, it, largely, it will keep you out of the hospital and keep you from dying, unless, of course, you're older or otherwise compromised. So there are always these gray areas, but um, largely boosters and shots protect people against Omicron. This is a sub-variant, theoretically, hopefully, prayerfully, it will <laughs> work the same against BA2, but, you know, still, we just don't know. Lilo, thank you again for always great reporting and information and joining me. Thank you, Raven. Congressman Pallon not only talking about his condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine today, but also on the future of electric vehicles. The congressman visiting Asbury Park to tout more than $15 million in federal funding to build out infrastructure that would offer convenient charging stations across Jersey. So how soon will that happen, and does it fit into the state's clean energy efforts to cut greenhouse gases? Melissa Rose Cooper reports. We know the price of gasoline, we know people spend a lot of money on gasoline, uh, and we know that it uh, pollutes and causes more greenhouse gases into, uh, go into the atmosphere, and that results in climate change. That's why Congressman Frank Pallone Jr. is applauding federal efforts to support the use of electric vehicles. New Jersey is set to receive over $15 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law that will help place more charging stations across the state. We expect over five years, New Jersey will get about $104 million. So this is the first installment. And the idea is to build, is for the New Jersey to put together, or each state, but I'll talk about our state, to put together a plan by August, uh, which then gets approved by the federal government, I think by the end of September. So we would start, even at the end of this year, starting to see uh, some of these uh, being put in place assuming the New Jersey plan is approved. Local officials and advocates joined the congressman in Asbury Park today to celebrate what they say is a first step to creating a cleaner economy. Emissions from cars and trucks are New Jersey's largest source of air pollution, and the state is pushing to get more electric vehicles on the road. Governor Murphy's goal is to have 330,000 EVs registered in New Jersey by 2025. New Jersey has the worst air quality in the nation. As we've heard here today, fossil fuel burning vehicles contribute to that, leading to uh, the exacerbation of health conditions such as asthma that disproportionately impact the most vulnerable members of our communities, those children and people of color who are, live in economically disadvantaged cities and neighborhoods. Advocates also pointing out the international crisis between Russia and Ukraine right now as another reason why having an infrastructure to support electric vehicles in New Jersey is so important. The Brent crude oil index reach a hundred dollars per barrel last night for the first time since 2014 as Russian forces launch an attack on Ukraine. Now I don't know about you but I am tired of depending on a highly volatile fossil fuel market that's completely intertwined to politics and war. This is just one of the charging stations here in Asbury Park. There are several hundred others across the state, but advocates say that's not nearly enough. Right now, a majority of New Jersey car, dr car drivers are interested in getting behind an EV, but they're concerned about range anxiety. They're worried about where to plug in. And obviously, 
we want to be able to make charging an electric vehicle as easy as going to a gas station because ultimately you know when you go to the pump and you you're, you you, uh, you know, pay for gas you're paying through the roof and you're also contributing to one of the largest sources of climate pollution in the state and the country and that's the cars and, and trucks we drive we know that electric vehicles are superior customer experience ev driver drivers love them but we just want to make it easier for everyone to get behind the wheel. Advocates say the funding will also help create more jobs as the electric vehicle infrastructure is built. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. As noted earlier, a big impact of the conflict in the Ukraine here will be the financial markets. Rhonda Schaffler joins us with the details and all the other top business stories. Rhonda? Raven, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has unnerved financial markets. The stock market plunged at the open, oil prices spiked higher, and investors moved money into safer assets, including treasuries issued by the U.S. government. Market watchers are worried about how the conflict will impact the world economy. Russia's economy would be hurt by sanctions, but sanctions could also exacerbate inflation. Without Russian supplies of food or energy, higher prices could follow, impacting other economies, including the U.S. Legislation to protect New Jersey residents from the effects of inflation, at least during tax season, will be considered next week by the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee. The bill would index state income tax brackets to annual changes in inflation, like the federal government does. As budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer explains, this would prevent what's known as bracket creep. So this idea of bracket creep is when your wages may go up from year to year, which pushes you into a different tax bracket in some cases, but the price of products like food and gas increases at a faster rate. And so you're actually not better off financially. If New Jersey would make this change, it would result in a tax break for residents and less revenue for the state. Two heavyweights are joining forces to strengthen manufacturing in the state. The New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program and the New Jersey Business and Industry Association have created a partnership called Manufacturing Counts to advocate for manufacturers in New Jersey. John Kennedy is CEO of the Manufacturing Extension Program. This gives us an opportunity and an option to be able to support more individual companies and individual people that are looking to join the, the workforce in manufacturing. Another step toward energy efficiency in this state, the Board of Public Utilities has signed off on Jersey Central Power and Light's plan to install smart meters, which are designed to curb energy use and potentially lower customer bills. After a tumultuous day on Wall Street, here's a look at how the stock market closed. I'm Rhonda Schapther, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. And make sure you tune into NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. This weekend, she looks at how robotics powered New Jersey's economy, from groundbreaking healthcare technology to how the youngest New Jerseyans are innovating through robotics and artificial intelligence. Check it out on NJ PBS Saturday at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Governor Murphy urging residents to stay off the road as a wintry mix of rain, sleet and snow is expected to arrive in Jersey tonight. The messy mix of snow and ice will impact northern Jersey and central parts of the state before it winds down Friday afternoon. The storm comes just after our state experienced unusually warm weather. Some parts of the state seeing 60 degrees on Wednesday. But the big swing in temperature is actually common during this time. Distinguished professor of environmental science at Rutgers University, Dr. Anthony Brock Broccoli says while we've had a relatively mild winter considering these past years, March could be full of surprises. A lot of those surprises are not so pleasant. And uh, we can even have 
substantial snowstorms in the early part of April. Uh, although most of the time, the snowiest period in New Jersey uh, is, is tapering off by the time we get to the middle of March. That just because winter has been mild so far, that doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. And that does it for us tonight. But if you missed any of the political headlines of the week, tune into Reporters Roundtable tomorrow morning. This week, senior correspondent David Cruz goes one-on-one -on -one with Jersey City Mayor Stephen Fulop to talk about the latest legislative maps and also chats with the team of local reporters to cover all the other big headlines. That's tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Raven Santana. Thanks for being with us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders. The caretakers of our historic landmarks and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.